So I think I'm actually going to kick us off if that's okay with everybody. So I would first of all just like to welcome all of our attendees that have joined us and I would also like to welcome our panelists. So uh, welcome to our first installment of the Marco uh, Academy in 2021. It is our third installment altogether and today we are going to be talking about uh, trends in the coffee industry in, and predictions in uh, 2021. So my name is Gemma, I'm the Head of Marketing here at Marco Beverage Systems and I'm going to uh, allow our panellists to introduce themselves in just a moment um, but before I go into that if I could just ask the attendees just for some quick housekeeping notes. So first of all if I could just ask, um, I think everybody is familiar with webinar etiquette at this point but if I could just ask everybody in our attendees to um, mute themselves please. And I can see that all videos are turned off, so that's great. Um, I have asked each of our panelists to um, come to the table today with their predictions. So if you guys have any questions throughout the webinar, please just drop them into the chat. Um, and if you have somebody specific that you want to direct the question to, um, please do outline that in the chat. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to give each of our panelists a few minutes to uh, talk about the predictions. And then we have about 30 minutes at the end for a bit of a chat. Um, and also just to note that we are recording this webinar and it will be available on our social channels um, afterwards. So what I'll do first is I will pass over to my panelists to introduce themselves. So I might start with yourself, Ed. Oh, hi, hi everyone. Um, thank you, Gemma. Um, for those of you that don't know me, <laughs> I've been part of Clifton Coffee since 2004. And um, back then, the scene was a little bit different. If you turned up to a coffee competition with uh, some scales and a stopwatch, you were called a cheat. So how things have changed since then. But we're a specialty coffee roaster. We are and a, well, a service provider, really, for coffee shops and anyone that just, just anyone who's just after a great coffee partner to support their business. We supply hundreds of coffee shops, restaurants and hotels. Uh, both independent businesses and, and chains, uh, as well as having a uh, direct sort of online presence with, with, uh, with our website. That's nice. Thank you, Ed. Paul, step up. Hi, my name's Paul. I'm from uh, Coffee Hit. Um, I started Coffee Hit in 2008, and our aim is to supply uh, amazing products to help people make uh, really great coffee at home and in the cafe, you know, via our online platforms. Luke. Hello, um, I'm Luke Powell from Sage Appliances. Um, the entirety of our goal is to help people make third rate speciality coffee at home. Um, but as well as that, I'm involved in all the other projects we do. So we sell loads of incredible um, home and domestic appliances so that you can create the equivalent of third wave but a provenance led food in every realm of your life. Very good. And David. Okay, thank you Gemma. And I'm David Walsh. I'm um, the R&D manager at Marco and I'll be your moderator today. Um, okay, will I take it from there Gemma? Okay, thank you. Okay guys. Um, hello to all our attendees. Um, so 2020 was a year of unprecedented upheaval. Uh, most facets of our economies and societies have been impacted and coffee is no exception. Um, so it is with this lens that um, we have asked our three panelists to reflect and prognosticate. And starting with Ed, um, as a specialty coffee roaster, uh, supplying many retail businesses. Um, how have you and your customers' propositions evolved in 2020? And what does it tell us about the future? Um, well, what I've learned in 2020 and the beginning of 2021 is that, well, everyone still loves coffee. Um, when people are allowed out and about, it goes up and down like a yo-yo, but when they're allowed out, our roasters are back on at full tilt. We're in the fast lane and we're, you know, we're in the fast lane looking after everyone. And when, when people are locked back down, we're just seeing a huge surge of coffee 
flowing into their homes with online sales increasing and some of our more fortunate customers that their coffee shops are in residential areas, they're, they're actually having record months and record sales. Um, so, I mean, this has just been a big shift and a big change in, in where coffee is going. Um, it, in this flow of coffee, it's, it, it has been sort of fairly, really kind of unfair on the more traditional kind of gold plated locations. You know, the pumping coffee shop on the high street that we always wanted to supply and the business area, sort of coffee and lunch break operators, they really are suffering their most. And they've really been dealt a, a fairly bad hand. And, you know, they're big sites, they've got the biggest rents to deal with and, and the biggest drop in footfall. And that kind of is going to be my first prediction, which I don't really want it to be a prediction. And I just predict that we haven't really seen the full fallout of this change in coffee flows away from some of the business areas um, and away from the main high streets. But starting with a negative one, a more, bit more positive, I don't think these sales are actually going to vanish. They're just going to move. They're going to move in home, but also near home. Um, and this is a big opportunity for coffee shops, and especially those ones in more residential areas. Some of them are already set up uh, like a little mini market during lockdown and selling essentials and other essential, you know, not essential, uh, other interesting local produce. I think they should keep going with that. I mean, we're selling more small bags of coffee than ever to our coffee shop customers for them to retail on to their customer base. People, you know, people are drinking more coffee at home, but they still need to buy their beans and other bits um, uh, from somewhere. Um, and what I've realized is that local people want to support local businesses. So my next prediction is that we'll see coffee shops continue to offer and expand their range of retail items, selling more coffee beans and maybe like just other interesting things uh, that they can find from local people that are looking for a market to sell their, their nice produce to. That's my next prediction. Um, I think in-home coffee drinking is actually helping drive up the speciality coffee market. Consumers at home are finally being forced to learn how to make good coffee. And we're seeing this spill over into increasing standards in coffee shops with more independent businesses choosing to buy higher end equipment than ever before. Uh, there's a lot of activity out there, believe it or not, uh, and we're seeing new businesses that are definitely not cutting back on their espresso machine budget. I am seeing cutbacks in the, like the total package with less grinders and maybe less alternative brewing methods going out the door. So my next prediction for 2021 is that we'll see more of a focus on um, coffee shops selling a more simplified but a much higher quality range of coffee with espresso based drinks increasing their dominance on the high street. But you know to finish up that we are still on a roller coaster and we're not off it yet and the coffee landscape will continue to change. I think the quality focused businesses will be the ones that are standing and if you're lucky enough that your customer base or your coffee shop is located kind of where people are spending more of their time, I think that once we get out the other side of this pandemic, you'll be busier than ever. Thank you very much, Ed. Okay, well, to move on to my next uh, panelist, I will um, suggest us, despite recently being usurped by Elon Musk, uh, the ballooning of Jeff Bezos' own fortunes in 2020 speaks to the degree to which online retail has thrived. And Coffee Hill is a long established online retailer of coffee equipment, uh, supplying the industry as well as end users. So Paul, uh, from your vantage point, what trends have you seen emerging? Well, I think the first uh, you know, prediction of a trend that I would make is I think you'll see people drinking more coffee at home than, than out of home. Um, you know, during 2020, you know, we were forced to make coffee at home. You know, we might have been homeschooling the kids. The office was shut. Uh, we just didn't have the time or the desire to head up to a cafe. Um, so what happened is people upgraded their coffee making facilities at home. 
So they got new products um, and they bought coffee online. So what has also helped sort of speed up that transition of more coffee in the home is people have had time to learn this new equipment. So previously you might have bought, you know, a piece of equipment to make some coffee and, you know, three weeks later it's in the back of the cupboard because I just don't get it. But because we've had all this time, I think it's built, they've ingrained it into their daily routine. So it's, it's more acceptable for them to get up and make a coffee at home. Um, now, I'm not saying people aren't going to go back to the coffee shops once everything's back to normal. They definitely are. But I think what you're going to see is more and more drunk at home. Now, for me, just like Ed was saying, it represents a fantastic opportunity for the local community coffee shop as the place to go to for their coffee, you know, whether it's at home or they're serving it to them in the cafe. If I look to the beer market in, in 2015 in the UK, the at-home sales first overtook pub, restaurant and trade sales for the first time ever. And that has continued up until now. So I think we'll see that trend in coffee. We'll see more and more people. And the thing is, if you drink coffee at home, well, it's easy to have four or five cups. Whereas in the cafe, you know, I might go and have one, maybe two if I'm there for a bit longer. So, you know, I think coffee at home is something to be really embraced um, by everyone in specialty. Um, so, you know, and, and looking at things, what's going to help this sort of trend that I think, you know, it's going to take five, 10 years, you know, um, before we see that sort of crossover. But, um, you know, people learning how to make decent coffee at home, that's going to help that because then they're more confident. Um, mm. The availability of good coffee, you know, both in the cafe now, online, um, is both going to help growth of, of coffee at home. Um, like I said, you drink more at home, you know, whether it's beer or wine or coffee, you just drink more, don't you? Because you're sitting around doing nothing, so you think, I'll just make a coffee. Um and also, I think, especially this year, you know, you'll see people reducing spending on non-necessities and, and out-of-home experiences, you know, because of, you know, there's going to be a recession or we're in recession and there's fear of job losses. There's also the fear, you know, that you know, we may be vaccinated or not, but there's still that COVID hanging over us. So I think that's going to push it along a lot this year as well, even though, you know, hopefully we, we come out of the other side of this. Um, so that's really my first prediction. Um, the other one sort of ties into it, which is, I think, you know, uh, you know we've seen it definitely online is going to grow and it, it, you know, it really took off in 2020 and it's going to continue for many years to come. The, the real, the real challenge for specialty coffee, you know, cause we are a niche, uh, a growing niche, obviously over the last sort of five, six years, um, is, is how do we reach this audience of people that now want to drink coffee at home? You know, they, they want to drink better coffee. Um, they want to learn how to make better coffee with new products. Where do I get the good beans from? And they need some education with that. So, you know, but I, you still go on to uh, any high street website or, you know, when you can get into a shop, um, you know, they're still selling the same old stuff. The, the Nespresso capsule machine and the old French press, that's their coffee section. So um, obviously they sell some Sage appliances, which are fantastic, but, um, you know, they still can't get good quality products and good quality coffee. So, you know, that that's going to be the challenge, I feel, for specialty coffee industry. And, you know, for, for cafes and coffee shops that have that, target market or in that local environment you know they can really start to help grow that and capture that market you know by offering the great products to make the coffee they can offer the bags of coffee but they can also do the education in the cafe you know simple quick training on how to make a coffee you know uh, is is going to get that community sort of uh, seeing that shop as my coffee place you know place to get all my coffee gear and learn about coffee um, so the challenge is online is crowded, right? So, mm -hmm. it, you know, gone are the days where you could stick up a website and the sales had come, you know, I mean, that when we started, I mean, especially coffee was small, but that was, you know, back in 2008, 
it was pretty much the case. You could put a website up and, and you'd get sales, but you got a lot of competition out there now. I mean, you look at roast, especially coffee roasters. I think 2008, there was probably four or five. There must be 250 in the UK now that call themselves specialty coffee roasters. So how do you get your message across? You know, so I really think social and digital media is what can stand specialty coffee apart. You know, it sort of levels that playing field. Um, and I think we need to use that to our advantage. Um, obviously, we've got some great people in the industry doing that and we need to support that and we need more people doing it. So I think that's where we need to go. So what's going to win online? Well, for me, online coffee subscriptions. I mean, you look at subscriptions, you know, it's an obvious one, but, you know, there's so many really good subscription services out there that we can sort of take um take notes from uh so i think that's going to be uh a, a big winner coming uh retail coffee in store you know click and collect home delivery and home delivery of coffee beans but also flat whites you know in your local community someone on an app yeah three flat whites delivered to this address boom where you go so i think that's going to be um we're going to see a lot more of that the other thing is we need to start using language that customers understand. I see so many websites, both coffee roasters, you know, other people selling product where they're not explaining that, you know, basically the customer wants to know how does this product solve my problem? That's all they want to know about. They may want to know other stuff later, but the first thing they want to read about it, how does that product fix my problem? And the problem is I want to make coffee, you know, and how does this product help me do that? But you look at a lot of product descriptions, you know, it explains about the owner's philosophy, you know, how they went to Guatemala and, you know, picked cherries with Yose. But the customer initially does not care about that. They just want to know how does this product fix my problem. That story can come later. But, you know, so I think we need to better uh, not scare people off with fancy descriptions. Um, my philosophy, simple and easy, always works, you know, there'll be shiny gadgety stuff that comes along and you know, you'll get, get people get drawn to it, but you know what? It ends up in the back of the cupboard and they're back to their error press, you know, so simple and easy always works. So always keep everything nice and simple and easy. Um, and just a nice explanation of how this product fixes that customer's problem. So, yeah, I think that's where we're at. Thank you, Paul. Okay. So um, most of us have spent more time in our homes in 2020 uh, than we may have predicted. And Sage Appliances um, make domestic kitchen appliances with a noted focus on coffee preparation. So Luke, how has the new paradigm affected Sage and its partners? What has been the response and what lies ahead? Well, it's been... It's been pretty incredible. Uh, it's been a pretty full on year. And uh, speaking of 2020, so our, our trends for 2020, we saw absolutely exponential growth, um, which which came with its own negatives, with its own positives. Um, but we saw thousands and thousands um, of like of machines going into people's homes. Um, mm -hmm. And the, probably the biggest the biggest trend I noticed was previously we were uh, well for periods of time throughout Sage's trading life. Like, um, we were cost driven uh, in that people would look online, look to deals and purchase products based on their price. For the entirety of 2020, um, we, we've been at RRP um, and most importantly, people are making decisions about the machine that they'll buy based upon their needs. So they're making higher value aspirational purchases as opposed to before where it was like, I kind of need a coffee machine. I also want to go on holiday. Now it's looking really deep into so the Sage range every single one of the machines fulfills like third wave specialty coffee at home from the cheapest one of the most expensive, which we don't usually try and reference price, but instead of people just buying like what's an entry level machine so that I can make coffee at home, people are, people are buying up to the one that actually suits them. Um, but not just suits them, the one that perfectly fits their, their drinking habits. Mm -hmm. So whereas before we would try and engender this conversation in store, um, uh, even if we have, we have roughly 35 demonstrators across the UK trying to help people make the right buying decision, um, the people would still buy based on price. Um, and they would obviously 
potentially down the line buy another machine. So it wasn't negative for us. Um, but we think now a lot of people have bought their perfect machine and they'll be happy with that for like years and years to come. Um, so that was the biggest one we just saw. Like an example would be, we usually hold about six months of stock. Uh, we pulled out of the stock of our bread maker within three days uh, for the year. Uh, and that's just because, you know, Tejo Appliance, every single appliance we make well, in every category outside of coffee as well would be like the best rated. Um, and we saw people just buying the best one because, you know, if the three things you do in the day are uh, make coffee, cook a meal, and I don't know, one other one, exercise, say, for example, all of a sudden those two things become like a really big part of your life. So I, and I hope that continues onwards. I think like any, any coffee you make um, that's horrible, like that shouldn't be a coffee you continue with. And um, the other term was like, we saw a lot of sincerity within social media, but also just need driven social media. So because again, there was nothing else to do in 2020, we, we noticed that a lot of people were doing stuff because they just want to do things. So a lot of the content being put out was a lot, a lot nicer and it was a lot more driven. I think as Paul said to, to the need of a customer. Um, I think people, as we had a shared experience, everyone's in exactly the same experiential place. All of a sudden, People were creating stuff because they were their own customer for once. Uh, you realize like, why am I doing this? Why am I setting up these care packages and entrepreneurial things where you're working alongside small ro like small roasteries, small cafes, um, just doing like, I, I know a few roasters who did like one-to-ones. Um, if I spoke to you in 2019 and said, do you want to do a one-to-one to every person who buys a coffee subscription? No roaster would have, no roaster did that and no roaster would have done that. And I wouldn't have recommended any roaster to do it. Um, but now all of a sudden it becomes hugely valuable to say like, why don't we talk to our customers? Why don't we figure out like what they're doing instead of continually releasing super niche, uh, niche within a niche. So like here's anaerobic uh, fermentation. We, we use champagne yeast. Um, here's a coffee. Do you want to try it? And the, you sell a, a tiny lot of bags. Like what do people drink? How do they help them drink it better? And how do we create products that suits that customer? So both of these trends, I hope they continue forever. Um, the higher value one is dependent upon how this recession goes. I, I doubt we're going to continue to sell 2,000 pound coffee machines if no one has any money. But my hopes is that will continue. Um, predictions for 2021, uh, we have every intention to keep selling machines at the same rate. So uh, I think, and this, this is probably the biggest one, I think there's a, a, a myth within the coffee industry that filters like the most drank coffee. Um, in reality, hopefully everyone gets the same reports as I do. Um, Milk-based espresso-based drinks are the biggest selling drink in the UK. Uh, customers don't change their tastes and their, and their preferences because they are in the home. <laughs> if you're like at home, you're not a different consumer to when you're in a coffee shop. And I think the, the more people sort of start to understand that, the better products and better services they'll create surrounding that. So I really hope that starts to catch up. Um, and people just give some genuine insight to their customers. Uh, and that would be, I, say, I think the big prediction would be things like the, the merging of virtual and physical. So coffee shops, exactly as Paul said, could not agree more. The idea that a coffee shop needs, coffee shops need to diversify the, the revenue that they have. And, and an amazing way to do that is not to consider selling more cups of coffee, um, but to sell your plate as an experiential service to your customers like a, a community hub where people come, they learn about coffee and instead of capturing, like the market research shows it, people drink about two to two to three if they're a really avid drinker, cups out of the home. Um, you, the speciality industry needs that to be five, 10 cups of coffee per day pretty much. Like we need people to buy more coffee and to buy more higher quality coffee. And a really great way to do that is with, with speciality. But the, co the coffee shop needs to understand that if they sell a ton of these like bags of coffee to home users, they'll garner more sales. It's, it's better in terms of margin led sales for coffee producers as well. Like it's, it's a great way to go in the future. So I just really hope that happens. It's more of a prediction that I just really think this comes true. Um, next one is like transition to the high street. So if, if coffee shops are becoming hubs, I would really hope that retail take the leaf out of this book and they'll have to make experiential choices to, to create an experience you actually want to go to. Um, going into a store and just seeing a bunch of machines that say between nine and 19 bars for an espresso machine isn't helpful to consumers. Spec driven stuff is not helpful to consumers. Um, we're, we're all for it. Like with the sort of market insight we get from our demonstrators in store in, in John Lewis, um, probably about 50% of users will come book them and say, I want a beans cut machine. Uh, that has no real reference. <laughs> like all the, all the machines in this, in this segment will 
convert beans into coffee. Uh, it would have been to a cup. That has that's a pointless statement. Like it, it, it doesn't give the customer any content. So hopefully, I really hope um, retail will start to catch on um, and start to create these in-store experiences where they can help people get speciality because that's the only way they'll compete. Otherwise, hopefully, cafes will will capture that market after this really like really growth state um, speciality bit. Um, and then like premiumization. So. I just really hope people buy more speciality. I think that's probably led to in the other one. I think our machines can fulfill that. But like even within filter, I think as long as you're selling coffee to a customer um, and giving them the opportunity to drink the coffee they really want to drink, then the, the companies that do that will succeed the most, but doing it in a way that's accessible. Um, I think the more uh, roasters, coffee shops speak to their customers, um, the more insight you'll get that will, will help you succeed. Um, Final, final one, it's like, I guess it'd be like off ball would be contract caterers and, and the whole, that whole beautiful bit of the coffee industry. Um, I think it, like the office space will start to devolve. Um, I know I'm not, I have no intention to go back to the office. I don't want to. Uh, I, don't, I don't know many other people who will. Obviously, once you take out in the UK currently, um, people are homeschooling. I, I think probably a lot of people will want to go back to an office for this period of time. Um, but I think a lot of office spaces will turn from sort of 2,000 people beer moths into 10 people office spaces. And I think currently there's a huge gap in the market to, to fill that need, um, even down to the, the average office space in the UK um, will be one. That, that is the current office space. But we need to figure out a, a way to serve those customers um, and to help them have great coffee. I know working in contract caterer coffee, uh, coffee services previously, some of the coffee in contract catering is absolutely exceptional. Um, and once people went home, it's probably helped drive our sales so much in that those customers wanted that same level of quality and they started to realize all those little signs in their sort of cafeteria that said fair trade and directly sourced, that actually means something. And it means something in the cup that, that they're missing now. Um, so that's my, that's my final one. I don't know if that will happen, um, but hopefully it just doesn't turn back to all the pointless institutions before where it's like, yeah, we need a 2,000 person office space. Why? I don't know. Because we have one for a while. We've signed the lease. <laughs> Thank you, Luke. Are you coming in here, Gemma, or am I just going to I'm continue? Just, just thanking the guys. Very interesting insights. Thank you very much. And I suppose I'm um, still keeping an eye on the Q&A if any of our attendees would like to throw in some questions. Thanks, guys. Okay, um, thank you to our three panelists. So now we're going into the segment where we're going to have some questions and the panelists are most welcome to interject um, at any point if they have something they would like to add. So I'm going to start with Paul and a question. You've spoken about um, the uh, booming online sales and people at home, um, you know, purchasing products to help them make coffee. So um, I suppose based on your experience, which products have uh, resonated or succeeded most uh, in, the, in this um, scenario and which have failed and why? Yeah, I guess um, what we've seen is, you know, if your previous product was like a French press or maybe even instant coffee, then you've, you've come in at a sort of quality lower price product. So, you know, and, and as I was saying, simple and easy wins. Aeropress, Clever, Chemex. I mean, head and shoulders above the rest. Um, if you if you want to create the out-of-home coffee experience in the home, then obviously you're going to have to, you know, go up to that sort of uh, sage level. And I'm sure the Nespresso pod machines have done amazing. Um, I mean, we don't sell those uh, machines, but you know, as Luke has said, they've, they've done very well. So, you know, um, those products, uh, if you wanted to replicate, but a good entry point, and, you know, we've seen it in our sales is, is just those simple devices that are easy to make, you know, quality coffee every time, you know, mm -hmm. the AeroPress, the Clever Drippers. Mm -hmm. um, typically the ones that fail or the ones that get returned to us, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, they're trying to improve on something that already works just fine. You know, someone tries to reinvent the clever dripper or the AeroPress, you know, that, that typically uh, 
doesn't tend to work or if it's just complicated to use you know it might look shiny and have some buttons and stuff but you know if it's hard to use or clean then um because it's not going to work you know you might see a quick spike in sales initially but the long term it, it just um fades away so you know all the, the the tried and tested ones have worked um have worked well over this lockdown and will continue to you know and if anyone ever asks me what should i have in my cafe it's you know it's those simple products that um i talked about the aeropress the clever the chemex you know they they're just easy to explain to the customer the customer gets it so um yeah steer away from the the fancy sure. stuff and i suppose luke made a point regarding um you know milk based espresso drinks being the you know let's say the uh the dominant preference in the uk um how and I suppose this can go to the panel in general, if anyone wants to chime in. How, how, do, um, how, how do customers, I suppose, succeed in creating drinks that meet their expectations of a specialty coffee shop at home, or how do they fail? I, I can answer what we try to do to solve this problem. Because no, this is, I, I wish if I want answers from the rest of the panel, because I don't know. I don't know how people, people see a lot of imagery on Instagram of like these beautiful, like 12 stacked tulips. Um, if you're doing that at home, Jesus, it probably means you work in a coffee shop, to be honest. <laughs> what did? So I think what we did, we started up a masterclass a virtual one last March. We've, we've led, we do it to about 500 people every week. That's one way, but that's the that's the bottom level. Like, I, I have no assumption that the people who lead that class are pouring tulips. But at the same time, it gets that level of like, are they drinking coffee the same as most coffee shops? Because yeah. um, I'm at the same point where like, mm -hmm. I, I would prefer a coffee from my machine at home than 90% of the coffee shops in London. That's inclusive of like greasy spoons and stuff, like an actual coffee shops, the full market. Um, and that's London, which has a really high, I think, outside of London, you can get to places where there just isn't a good coffee shop. I'm, I'm sure some people on this call have realized that there's there's a few really great coffee shops across the UK, um, and there's a lot of really bad ones. <laughs> I mean, I think making coffee at home is really, really hard. And this is why people flock to coffee shops. And no matter what you do at home, the coffee shop doubles down and does it better. If, yeah. if, if you're at home and you buy an AeroPress, or a clever coffee dripper, the coffee shop buys a dual boiler coffee machine. You know, if you're at home and you go and buy a Sage espresso machine to make your flat whites and lattes at home, the coffee shop goes and buys, you know, a multi-boiler coffee machine and multiple grinders or something even fancier, a coffee machine built, built under the counter. You know, coffee shops just make, making coffee is really hard, you know. So if you want a really great cup of coffee, you've got to just go to your coffee shop. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's always been, you know, we've never sold espresso machines, you know, because of that, it is hard to replicate that cafe experience in home um, as much as you want to try, you know, and I always say to customers, you know, for three quid, you can go to the coffee shop, you're going to get a professional to make the coffee, and they're even going to wash up for you, you know, it's, it's the best three quid you can ever spend. So, but not everyone has access to, you know, fantastic, good coffee. So, you know, that's where the, the home appliance probably comes in. But, um, you know, certainly, you know, our focus is brewed coffee and uh, that's by far easier to get right and, and make delicious every single time than, than trying to uh, master in a, a home espresso machine. I might yeah. try and jump in here, guys, with a question from um, our attendees. So we've had some some interesting questions, and um, so so maybe if I was to just take one, um, I think we had spoken earlier about um, you know doing good coffee, simply doing it well, high quality coffee, um, that kind of being the focus um, that that you guys have seen emerging. Um, following on from that, has there been any insights? And I suppose this would go across the panel on. Um, kind of coffee drink shifts. So, you know, we saw a lot of capsules, we saw a lot of, um, you know, instant 
coming out in 2020. So does anybody have any insight on where that might go in 2021 in terms of different types of coffee drinks, whether that's by delivery method or whether that's by, um, you know, different types of, of, like you say, cold brew, nitro, all of these kind of things. Where, where do we see coffee drink trend, trends going in 2021? I don't see it going anywhere. Um, if anything, it's gone backwards. I mean, for years we've been trying to, and the industry is trying to push new drinks, um, different brew methods, concepts, mm. super light roasts into the marketplace. Um, but, I, you know, I just see winning normal, delicious coffee. You know, the, the coffee shops that are winning are, are not offering different fancy drinks. They're just offering a nice, I don't know, a barista with a smile. Mm. A barista gets to, and an owner gets to learn their customers and what they want and just really engage with them and, and make them feel special. Um, and just sort of a little bit old fashioned maybe. Um, but I, I would have thought that the, the whole sort of last year and the pandemic has probably just almost put us backwards a little bit. And when people go out and about now, they, they kind of just want to go back to basics, just, mm find really delicious, normal coffee. Yeah, I, d I definitely think there's a, a shift away from pods. You know, I'm, I'm sure pods have grown, you know, don't get me wrong, but um, certainly, you know, anecdotally among friends that I never talk coffee to are suddenly asking me, I want to move away from pods because of the environmental aspect of it, you know, and, and what should I do? And it's like, well, first step is, you know, just get pre-ground in the so I think maybe pods would be the first casualty of, you know, if we were to see a decline in any mm. um, sector of, of the way coffee's delivered. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we all hope that whole bean, you know, grows and continues to grow. And that's certainly the, the best way for customers to experience uh, great coffee. From, from my standpoint, uh, based on the sales of machines that we're having, uh, I would say there's going to be a massive growth in capsules and there's going to be a massive growth in espresso. Um, I think a lot, of, a lot of people have misunderstood the, I guess, the spacing of the market and the infant still the leader across the UK by, by an astronomical amount. Um, and I think everyone's goal should be to transition those people into sustainable and, and ethically traded coffee. So I think any wins for capsules are a future win for whole bean. Um, and that's pretty much how we track our market. Uh, we want people to transition from instant, which is the biggest user base, up to capsules because maybe I think, yeah, as, as Ed said, um, doing espresso at home is really, really, really hard. Like, really hard. Can't explain it. There's no simple way. There's no magic wand. Um, we obviously, the stage machines do as much work as possible to make it as easy as possible. Like, I've got a machine here that's the cheapest one, and it does automatic flat white milk, like with old milks, with regular milks. Like, I would argue that. It makes it a lot easier than going to a coffee shop. Um, but I would say, yeah, like uh, as long as instant declines and capsules, I, I have no real preference either way. Like uh, I don't like capsules, so I, I don't care if they succeed or fail. Um, but then as long as people from capsules transition up to whole bean, I should be really happy. But in terms of the actual drinks drunk, I, I double that. I reckon people, more and more people will want espresso. Um, I think they would have tried filter. Um, I think a lot of the world of specialty stuck in a bubble where, which is, which I'm in as well. Like I only drink filter, just to clarify. I have an espresso machine. I really, I, I, I calibrate it weekly because we run our master classes, but I, I don't really use it for espresso that much. I, I drink filter through a batch brew mm. daily, every single day. Um, but I think the majority of people in the UK based upon our machine sales, um, are espresso led and the, their interest in buying espresso machines is going up and I don't think they're getting rid of them. Like I don't, I think they are being used. I don't think they're creating the best coffee experience, especially with obviously all of our competitors. Um, but no, even with Sage machines, like our main onus for this entire year is to try and help people make a flat white, I'm trying, to, trying to help them make natural at home, trying to help them make Delgonas, which who cares about, um, but mostly trying to help them make espresso-based drinks like the ones in their coffee shop, but from a really teared-down menu. Like, I wish more roasters put out really decent blends um, and help people make, like, a flat white. Just be like, what drink do you drink? I'll help you make it. And Luke, just, just following on from that, it was actually a question again from one of our attendees. With that kind of 
at home experience trying to make trying to make it as good as it possibly can be for the needs of the customer as you've articulated um how, how can you combat different qualities of water around you know at home water is that something that you guys <laughs> i've hit a nerve have I? no no not at all no i think water quality on our list of things that we want to teach people about um water quality i know the importance of it like please don't get me wrong in this in this um water quality is the last thing that we look to like all of our machines have an inbuilt water filter so but that's mostly for longevity of the machine we don't rebalance mineralization um we don't do any of the stuff because it scares people away and i think the more that people talk about the ultra niche things in coffee the less the overall market will grow uh, because it becomes unattainable even for people within coffee um like i again i do use um our own water but at the same time i don't expect that i wouldn't if i was going to sell someone a coffee machine i wouldn't say well first you need to have an inbuilt water filtration system um or first you need you know you bought a 600 pound machine now you need to buy a 3000 pound grinder or now you bought a 3000 pound grinder now you need to buy a reverse osmosis um filtration device i think the the, the space for water is just as big as it is it always is um, but I think a simple Brita or BWT or even just using like Ashbeck um, or any of the bottled waters from supermarkets it, is easy. And that, that's a super available um, method for people to attain the same quality of water as they would do in most. Again, that the level of using those kind of filters, um, as someone who used to sell water filters to a lot of coffee shops, I'd argue the majority of their water filters are no longer doing the task that they thought it was. And the majority of coffee shops don't actually have any uh, guidance or don't put very much work. I know that there's a lot that do and do an incredible job of creating those like absolutely exceptional experiences. Mm. But the, the large majority of coffee shops just put in a bit of filter and they're like, we're done, finished. Maybe I'll change it when it starts to explode or rot or water comes out the bottom. But in the, the large scale of people, unless they're being served by, by Clifton, <laughs> um, they probably won't do a great job of, of upholding great water quality. And I, I wouldn't expect home users to be even uh, on the that. Espresso at home is tough, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, you know, an, another just brief bit. So I guess put it in this perspective, um, you usually, you change your water filter in a coffee shop, like, I don't know, every six months, based on the flow rate. Um, if you drink, that's because you're making five, Six hundred coffees a day. If you're really having a great time, how long users make two coffees a day, and the the actual porosity of the filters doesn't change. So the water filters last three months, twelve months, and to change them is just to pop it in. So I'd say it's easier for home users, as in there's no skilled labour, to to keep their water filtered. Mm. Keeping it mineralized is another thing that I, I don't want to. I don't want to. Okay, um, Ed. Um... We spoke a lot about, um, I suppose, coffee shops changing what they're doing, what they're selling, you know, when they can sell. Um, my question, I suppose, first to you and then to the rest of the panel is, to what extent is the, you know, coffee retail business model still viable? And what, um, what advice might you have for someone opening a coffee shop in 2021? Um, we're seeing still a lot of activity of new coffee shops um, and, and as soon as we're allowed out as soon as they turn off the restrictions it's literally back in the fast lane 100 miles per hour again I mean not for everyone there's some locations that you know they've been dealt a, a really crappy hand and mm. they've uh, you know they're going to struggle or, or not struggle it's just going to take longer and they've just got to stick in there and, and hopefully it will come back which just take a little bit longer um, but the coffee shops in the more residential areas, the secondary high streets, places where you find a butcher's and a florist and things like that, you know, that we're still a lot of vibrancy out there. And we, you know, this year we've had lots of meetings already with people. Um, I've sold, you know, we've sold several machines. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I would say it's still going. It's still there's nothing to be afraid of there's people around if you're in a place where people are uh, put your coffee shop make delicious coffee make them feel good when they come in and don't scare them they'll keep coming back you know you're gonna 
you're going to make um, you're going to do well um, mm. people or coffee follows people or people follow coffee one of those ways around mm. a, qu a question from our attendees on that kind of high street coffee um, model that you know uh, one of the questions around Pret and Leon um, offering unlimited coffee subscriptions so there, there's a question around um, and Ed maybe maybe this could be directed to you. Um, do you think that people see that those unlimited coffee subscriptions as potentially, you know, being um, devaluing the value, or, you know, a, per a perception of devalued high street coffee? So is it something potentially that they might regret in six to 12 months when everybody else starts reopening? Um, I mean, I don't like it. I think we've always devalued coffee. We've always, always struggled to maybe sell coffee for what it's truly worth. And the independents that have really gone to town with everything, you know, because they wanted the very best um, reverse osmosis water and coffee machine and the most expensive coffee, they always struggled to sell coffee for what it's, um, you know, the effort they put in because mm -hmm. the kind of price is sort of capped at people that, you know, offering far too cheap coffee. Um, and you know, espresso is still going, and, and this is something that's really hammered filter coffee back, I think. Um, some of the big chains almost just doing, you know, unlimited refills and, and all this sort of thing on filter coffee. And it's just not allowed it to get the traction that we all wanted it to, you know, especially after a few years of doing manual brew bars and things everywhere. We thought filter coffee might have really got, got out there, but it's still, it just still seems to be espresso dominance still. Um, but uh, I, I think we just got to keep doing what we do. You know, we've got to keep telling the story. You know, there's so many speciality coffee roasters out there. Mm -hmm. Most of them are doing a really good job. And all they've got to do, and all we try to do, it's not about, you know, sell, sell, sell. It's just about trying to be as authentic as possible. Tell the story. We've got amazing stories to share. And, you know, tell it in a way that our customers or consumers will believe and if they can trust what we're doing is a good job, then that, that will keep, help us drive sales forward. Thanks, Ed. Same question to Paul, I think. What, what advice would you have for a you know, coffee shop looking to open in the next year? I think uh, I'd, I'd be looking to offer, you know, a, a, the complete package for the customer. So, you know, not just the, the, the board of cappuccinos, lattes, you know, don't shy away from the fact that they're going to make coffee at home. You know, that's going to happen and they're probably going to make more at home than ha having your coffee shop. So, you know, just start to embrace that. Offer retail coffee, you know, really easy, simple products to sell, to make the coffee and some quick training sessions after hours, you know, 15 minutes. That's all they need. This is a clever drip up thing, you know, done. That's how you use it. They can then go home, they come back for the coffee, they'll have a chat about the different coffees you've got on the shelf, you know, and you become that one-stop shop in your community for all things coffee, you know, and that's, you know, you go to places like Melbourne and stuff, you go in there, every wall has retail product on it, yet you go into 99% of coffee shops in the UK, the retail walls are, are empty, you know, there's nothing they're not selling a lot of products. So I think that's where we need to change. You know, we can sell, you can upsell a lot of product with, um, you know, both coffee and the hardware as well. Mm. I agree. I have a, a, another question from our, from our attendees, um, an industry-wide question. Um, a trend we saw in 2020 was around consolidation within the industry. So where do you guys see that going in 2021? <laughs> that'll continue you know a lot of places expanded quickly with a lot of debt and you know they're going to struggle you know the um you know they're going to have 20 percent less revenue for the next 18 months possibly two years and you know once the taps turn back on you know landlords are going to want rents you know debt needs repaying um you know, uh, so I think if you've got debt or a lot of debt, then you're going to struggle and there will be consolidations. You know, there'll be um, there'll be smaller roasters that a lot of their customers have gone out of business. You know, so they're going to struggle. Um, yeah. So I think consolidation will speed up this year. Definitely. Mm. 
Okay. Um, so let's say we get to 2022 and we're all vaccinated and COVID is no longer a problem. What do we think will revert to the way it was and, and what will not? Luke. I would, I think these will all be hopes. I think people, people are very, I think a lot of people are stuck in their ways. I think a lot of things will go back to normal, like offices will reopen, people will be forced to go back to them. And then from there, things will return. But I think a lot of people have kind of seen the light, like a lot of people have realized that, that there are better ways to work, there's better ways to live, and that there's better experiences you can have with coffee. Like for me, the, the speciality experience is having a true dialogue with the, with the, or, with origin all the way to your, to your cup, which is like super idealistic. And I don't think that's being delivered in a lot of high street coffee shops, especially like high street coffee shops, that story is, is going untold. Mm -hmm. um, but at home, I think that's an incredibly good thing to do. I think if I would love it, if people like if, for example, instead of 4% of coffee sold in the UK being speciality, it was 5% or 6% or 10%, we dream big. I, I would love that. I think hopefully that will go back. Um, the brew methods people have found, be it filter, be it espresso, like I think people will stick to it and they'll reduce. Um, hopefully coffee shops will go into more, more not rural, but easier instead of these, exactly as um, Ed said, like instead of this gold high street everyone goes to visit, it would be great if all these little coffee shops that have been started up by super passionate individuals if they stick around, that would be incredible. Like that would be a huge boon for the industry if if those mm. essentially evangelists of coffee stick around and their businesses are viable. They're not like living hand to mouth, but they're, you know their their uh, neighbourhood instead of travelling to work and going to Nero, mm. stays at home and goes to the coffee shop for their meetings. And it's this this new super trendy, nice hipster ideal. Like I, I kind of want that. It's really nice at the moment. I know everyone hates lockdown, but there's there's some really good bits of it. Like I, I, yeah. uh, with with the addition of being able to leave the house, that, that would be. I want that bit to change, obviously. Okay, uh, Ed, what will uh, go back to the way it was, and what will not? Um, well, I think when we're allowed to go out, there's going to be literally a three month party, and we'll be going. And we'll we'll be playing catch up with all those experiences and coffees that we didn't get to have out and about. Um, and all our restaurant customers will be full. Mm. Our, cus our coffee shops will have queues going out the door of everyone <laughs> just desperate to experience what they've been sort of deprived uh, and has been taken away from them. So I think we'll be, we'll be super, we'll go straight back to super busy. And we saw this already last year uh, in August when it was stimulated with the Help Out Retail Scheme. It just went mm. off the scale. And September and October for us were as busy as the September and the October yeah. the year before. Yeah. Um, because we were allowed to. November came along, you know, everything got, the uh, factories got closed again. We we're told to go back home and it just, you know, straight back down. Really has been like a roller coaster. Um, so I, I just think people are desperate to get back to normal and as soon as we're allowed to, we'll be straight back in the coffee shops, in our restaurants, in hotels, and enjoying living. Um, um, will that I think there's coffee shops, that, yeah. Go ahead, coffee Ed, shops that can offer good experiences. Um, that's what people want. That's what people want. They want to go back, have a nice experience, and have delicious coffee. And, and on that, Ed, do you think that the coffee shops, do you think they're going to, obviously, most of them transition to a takeaway? Um, model obviously during lockdown so they could stay open do, you know do you think coffee shops are going to stick with that takeaway model or do you think that when they can they're just going to open right up fill the place with seats try and get bums on seats how do you think their models are going to are going to change in 2021 well I think the the seats bit's probably going to take a bit longer because it's not going to just be like a switch you click and mm -hmm. and the shops are going to have to you know for for people to really want to go, they're going to have to feel safe still, um, you know, with everything that's happened. Um, but um, I think the takeaways really made a big comeback. I mean, take disposables, you know, mm -hmm. they were they were dead mm -hmm. uh, a year ago, and it was all about, you know, re reusable cups. Mm -hmm. um, and now disposables are back. Um, but the takeaway is, I think it's really helped a lot of our customers. You know, they've been able to open and um, do takeaway in a very 
sort of simple manner with very much lower labor costs on board. And some of them, like I said, have been doing really well. So I think, you know, takeaway will stick around. Um, and the one people will sit in, but I think the, the sites are still going to have to make it feel safe for them for, for a while. Mm -hmm. and, and then actually it's just to another quick question from our um, attendees. Um, a trend that we had also seen in 2020 um, in Ireland anyway, was ref uh, coffee shops refusing to serve reusable cups. So keep cups and things from a hygiene point of view. Um, and, and there was a question around uh, from one of our attendees, do you think reusable cups will be more widely used in 2021? Um, obviously provided it's done safely. Um, or, or is it a way of a coffee shop trying to push their branded cups on Insta with that kind of higher takeaway? Where, where do you see that going? I don't know. I mean, I think they will come back and they will start, you know, get used more mm -hmm. um, as soon as it's seen as sort of um, COVID safe or, or whatever or, or, or acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, and that people have kind of just bounced back the other way and they've done everything super clean and, and super, super safe or, or, or whatever. And I think they'll just figure out a way that, that it's allowed. And as soon as they go, yes, it's allowed, then just start flowing again. So, David, I might leave the, la the honour of the last question to you. Um, we are, are you sure? We have a lot of questions I see in the we, chat. We do. So I think what we've done, we've five minutes left um, and, and we've actually got quite a few questions in the chat. I, I, I do think um, from reading some of them that the guys may have answered them um, without, without directly addressing the question. Um, but what we might do just, just for the last is... Um, uh, I think the guys would be happy maybe after this webinar, either in a blog or, or in a pre-recorded video. Um, we will try and answer these questions and put them up on our social channels afterwards because I know we didn't get to all of them. So if your question hasn't been answered, we'll, we'll try and follow up, as I said, either in a blog or in a video for you guys. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave it to you, David, to, to select the last question maybe and see us out. Okay, well, I'm going to pick one from the chat, right? Because I think um, I'd like to thank all our attendees for offering so, so many questions. Um, well, let's see. Okay. Mike Gascoigne, has the cold nitro coffee sales or interest now pretty much disappeared? And is there any scope uh, for at-home nitro? I mean, I, I, I've sold nitro gear to cafes and um, I mean, it's hard to do at home, but yeah, it, it never really took off here. So um, whether it's dead or not, I don't know. But, um, you know, you go into the Starbucks and they are trying to do it. And then if, you know, if they can't do it, then, <laughs> you know, uh, what chance have we got? So I, I, I feel it's a bit of a fad, but, um, you know, I'm happy to be proven wrong. But, yeah, yeah, I don't. Making nitro coffee at home is actually relatively easy if you just get a siphon and some nitro canisters. I'd, I'd, you know, I wouldn't sell it on the street. Um, but yeah, it's not a party <laughs> trick. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, even though it's easy, I don't know. I never got nitro. I, I think there's, it, it looks cool and stuff, but I, I don't think it adds to I've never had one that I thought improved the coffee. If, if, you, if you cut them side by side, like here's just some filter, here's some cold brew, and here's some nitro, uh, that would be the order of their quality. If, if, if you use exactly the same coffee, like the filter is going to be the nicest, the cold brew will be less nice than the filter, and the nitro will be worse than the, the both. Yeah, and then the hot filter will be the best. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Okay, well, listen, as I said, I, I really, um, fantastic um, contribution from everybody in, on the panel. So I'd like to thank, thank each of you guys, David, Ed, Luke, and Paul. Thank you guys so much for sharing your insights and your trends. And as we say, hopefully, looking into our Crystal Bowl 2021 will be a far more positive, um, fun, open experience for all of us. And uh, to all of our attendees, I'd like to, again, thank you guys very much. As I've said, the webinar will be um, up on our social channels as a video, and we will be coming back with the answers to the questions that we didn't get a chance um, to look at. So thank you, everyone. Onwards and upwards. Thank, thank you, guys. You. Thank, thank you very everyone. much. Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in. Oh, sorry, just uh, Gennaro, it will be on our Facebook, Twitter, oh. and, and LinkedIn. We'll put links of it on all of our channels. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye. Cheers.